Chapter 5 of The Mystery of the Chinese Ring by Andy Adams Jack Hudson Nam Palung meant business. There was no question about that. But Biff had no intention of yielding without a struggle. He would make his escape if at all possible. Right now, as his mind whirled trying to think his way out of this predicament, it would be best to do exactly as he had been told. Biff promised himself one thing. Once he was free of Nam Palung, he, Biff Brewster, was going to give himself one swift kick. He had been played for a sucker, a trusting, easy-to-take American, and he had filled the role perfectly. How, he now thought, could he have been so taken in? The jeep rolled across the field. Biff shot a sidelong glance at Nam Palung. The jeep moved at a steady pace not fast enough to attract attention. It was headed towards a gate in the high wire fence surrounding the airfield through which service trucks passed. He noticed that the gate was blocked by an iron bar, raised to allow a vehicle to pass underneath it. When raised, the bar on its upright poles looked like a football goalpost. As the jeep drew near and fell in line behind a truck and a small car, Biff noticed the bar was raised just sufficiently to allow about a foot's clearance for the vehicle passing underneath. An idea came into Biff's head. He turned to look over his shoulder at his knife-bearing guards. Keep your head straight forward, Nam ordered, and no tricks as we pass the gateman. Biff watched the truck ahead pass through. It slowed down without stopping as it passed under the raised bar. The bar was lowered to stop position after the truck's tailgate went through. Next came the smaller car, its roof much lower than the truck's. Again the bar was raised, but this time just high enough to accommodate the car, leaving about two feet between it and the car's top. Now the jeep approached the bar barricade. The bar began rising slowly. Biff watched it, his heart in his mouth. Don't let them raise it too high, he prayed. Biff leaned slightly forward, placing his weight on his firmly planted feet. He tensed his leg and thigh muscles until they felt like tightly coiled steel springs. The bar was about three feet higher than tall Nam's head. Biff waited until the front of the jeep was directly under the bar. Then he leapt up as if he had been blasted off a launching pad. His hand seized the bar. Like a trapeze artist, he swung his body forward in a giant arc. At the top of his swing, when his body was parallel to the ground, Biff twisted his head, looked over his shoulder as his body started a swift downward stroke. At the split second, he lashed out with his feet. One foot struck the left knife wielder square on the side of his head. The man shot over the side of the jeep as if jerked by the hand of a giant. Biff's other foot struck the second knife wielder full in his chest, toppling him out of the back of the jeep. Now Biff was propelling himself into the backwards arc of this swing. Again his body came swiftly downwards. He lashed at Nam, planted both feet solidly in the oriental shoulders. Nam shot forward, his head striking the windshield. Biff swung his body sideways and dropped to the ground. He ran back towards the terminal building, nearly half a mile away. After a hundred yards he slowed to catch his breath. Turning he looked back at the jeep. There was no need to run. Nam still lay sprawled over the steering wheel. One of the knife bearers was out of sight, apparently still sprawled on the ground on the other side of the jeep. The other guard was just rising from behind the jeep. Biff saw him stagger, still not fully recovered. There would be no more trouble with those three, Biff said to himself. Not right away at any rate. The boy continued toward the terminal building at a rapid walk. He didn't run, no need to, and if he did he might attract attention. He might be stopped. Explanations would be demanded. The gatekeeper might come up and describe what had happened. Biff needed time to think. What was his next move? Guess I'll have to play it by ear, he told himself. And what, he wondered, had happened to Uncle Charlie? Had he been waylaid by those same three? Inside the teeming terminal building, Biff mingled with the constantly moving crowds. He hoped he wouldn't be noticeable, but there was little chance of that. In his American clothes, grey slacks and open neck shirt, he was as noticeable as an Oriental dressed in Mandarin clothes would have been at the Indianapolis airport. 
There was only one thing to do, Biff decided. Go to the airline check-in counter and see if any message has been left for him by his uncle. The boy approached the counter cautiously. He wanted to look around before identifying himself. Biff sidled up to the counter. A tall, handsome man about 30 years old was leaning over the counter questioning the clerk intensely. He was wearing white drill trousers and a white shirt open at the collar. A well-shaped, close-cropped head topped a strong neck and broad shoulders. He spoke to the clerk in a voice filled with authority. Unless he was badly fooled again, Biff felt sure that this man was an American, and there was something about him that the boy liked immediately. Hold it, Biff said to himself. Let's not jump too fast this time. Standing behind the man, Biff saw him take out a worn wallet from his hip pocket. Now you listen to me. I'm Jack Hudson. I'm a pilot for Explorations Unlimited. Here, take a look at my papers. I'm here to meet a boy named Biff Brewster, and I want to know where he is. Right now. The clerk leaned on the counter. He carefully inspected the list of names on the paper in front of him. So so the no name like one you say on the list. Is that your passenger manifest list? The man Jack Hudson demanded. The clerk nodded his head. Without asking, without waiting, Hudson snatched the list from the man's hand. Here, you can't do that. Hudson ignored the clerk. His eye ran down the list quickly. At just what do you think this name is? Hudson held his index finger beside one of the names. Oh, so sorry. I guess I no understand your talk. Fat chance, Hudson said angrily. Now you just tell me where that boy is. Biff had made up his mind. He couldn't be mistaken in this man of action. I think you're looking for me, sir, Biff said, and placed his hand on Jack Hudson's arm. Hudson swung round. He looked Biff up and down, slowly, carefully, sizing him up, before answering. If I weren't so glad to see you, I'd ask where the devil you've been. Then, seeing Biff's face fall, Hudson smiled a warm, immediately friendly smile. But the important thing is I've found you. I guess it's mostly my fault that you've had trouble meeting me, Biff confessed. I had a little mix-up with... He cut his sentence short. Perhaps he had better wait until he got to know Jack Hudson better before revealing all the mysterious happenings that had taken place from that early hour in the morning four days ago back in Indianapolis. Well, part of it's my fault too, Jack said, or the weathers. Coming in from Yunhaya, I ran into a terrific headwind. Should have allowed for it. These winds spring up all the time in these parts. I was late. But come on now, we've got to clear you with customs and get your gear. Jack Hudson, with a forcefulness sharp enough to cut any red tape, literally bulldozed Biff through a maze of inspections, checks and rechecks. I'm slipping, he grinned at Biff when the boy had been cleared. Took me 31 minutes. My record's 29. Come on, we've got to make with the plane back to Nheo. Fast. Lots to be done. That suits me. I'm anxious to see my uncle. Hope he's there when we get back. A frown creased Jack's face as he spoke. He will be, won't he? That's what I was told, that the emergency came up quickly and... Biff ended his sentence feeling foolish. He suddenly remembered who had told him the story. Emergency? I don't know of any emergency. Your uncle wasn't even in Unheo today. It was arranged for me to pick you up before he left. Before he left? What do you mean? Biff was getting puzzled. Your uncle flew out of Unheo over a week ago. Chapter 6 of The Mystery of the Chinese Ring by Andy Adams Interrupted Message Darkness had spread over the airfield by the time Biff and Jack Hudson reached the Explorations plane. It was a twin-engine Cessna, a five-passenger, capable of speeds of 250 miles per hour. Hop in, Biff, Jack said. Be my co-pilot. Jack stowed Biff's gear and took his place in the pilot's seat. As quick to action as Hudson was, he was also a sober, careful pilot. He warmed up the plane's motors. He tested the wing flaps. He made a thorough instrument check. Then he called the tower for take-off instructions. The plane moved to its assigned runway. Once more Jack revved up his engines. Then the brakes released, the plane started rolling down the runway. 
Once it was airborne, Jack put the plane in a steep climb, made a wide circle over the city of Rangoon, then headed north, following the Irrawaddy River. How long before we get there? Biff asked. About four hours, if we don't hit any weather. Nunhaya's about fifty miles north of Mayitkeena, about eleven hundred miles from here. How big's Unhao? Is it much of a place? Biff asked. Jack grinned. Take a look back at Rangoon. That's the last civilization you're going to see for a while. The plane sped through the night. As the moon rose out of the South China Sea, its light turned the Irrawaddy River, thousands of feet below, into a slender silvery ribbon, reflecting the moon's rays like a long sliver of mirror. Jack Hudson put the plane on automatic pilot. He reached behind him and brought out two boxes. He handed one to Biff. Hungry? Biff hadn't thought about eating, but now he realized he was ravenous. I'll say I am. Thanks a lot. He practically tore open the box and chomped on the sandwiches with an appetite that made Jack wonder when the boy had last eaten. Just before midnight, Hudson switched on the plane's radio transmitter and called the landing strip at Unheo. Keep your eyes dead ahead for the next few minutes, he told Biff. I always get a thrill out of it. He did as he was told. He peered intently through the windshield into the night. Clouds had obscured the moon and all was darkness. Not a light could be seen anywhere. Suddenly, as if by magic, the letter X blazed out of the jungle, twenty miles ahead. It was so startling that Biff gasped in amazement. Our landing field. I told them we'd be in in about ten minutes, and so to turn on the lights. We have two runways: one from southwest to northeast, the other from southeast to northwest. They bisect in the centre, forming a perfect X. I think it's a wonderful sight. It sure is," Biff replied. For the next few minutes, Jack's entire attention was devoted to the landing. The plane swooped out of the dark, flashed over the landing field, circled, and entered its final glide path. Biff felt the lurch, which told him they had touched down. Jack taxied the plane toward the hangars. Well, here we are," he said to Biff. "Welcome to Unhao." Despite the excitement of landing in this strange, isolated spot in Upper Burma, Biff couldn't hold back a yawn. He was just plain dog tired. It had been four nights since he had slept in a bed. Oh, he had slept, but sleeping in a sitting position, he told himself, would never replace the good old stretch-out type of snooze. Native servants swarmed round the plane. Biff and his gear were deposited in a jeep standing by. Jack hopped behind the wheel. The jeep, with natives clinging to every possible foot and handhold, headed through the night towards headquarters house, a quarter of a mile away. Headquarters house was a combination of office, communications centre, and living quarters for the staff of Explorations Unlimited. Sleeping rooms resembling those of bachelor officers' quarters on an army post filled one end of the building. Into one of these went Biff. Moments after his head hit the pillow, he was in a deep sleep, in spite of the murky heat that was unrelieved by the lateness of the night. Around five o'clock in the morning, as dawn was transforming the night blackened jungle into a greenish maze, Biff was awakened by the sound of running feet passing his door. These were followed by others. The whole building seemed to spring to life. Something was up. Biff jumped out of bed. First, he went to the window. Looking out, he saw a tremendous animal, faintly outlined in the morning mist, not more than thirty feet away. Just as he was about to call out, he saw the floppy ears and the swaying trunk of the animal raised towards the sky, and let go with a trumpeting that rattled the windows. Biff had to smile at himself. What was an elephant doing wandering around loose at that time of the morning? Some difference from home, he thought. Biff dressed quickly. He hurried down the hallway toward the center of headquarters house. Sounds of activity came from the communication center. 
He paused in the doorway. Jack Hudson and two other men were bunched together around a shortwave receiver. Static crackled throughout the room. One of the men picked up a hand microphone. This is HH1 calling. This is Happy Harry 1 calling X0369. Come in X0369. Repeat, come in X0369. We were beginning to read you. Acknowledge, do you read us? His answer was a roar of static. Jack Hudson shook his head. His concern and the intense looks on the faces of the other men told Biff they were troubled. Was it keen, Mike? Jack demanded. Was it Charlie? Biff heard Jack's question, and he felt a sudden pang of fear. The radio operator, Mike Dawson, shook his head. I can't say for sure. I think it must have been, but the voice was so faint and static. Could you make out anything? Any of the words? Jack's voice was insistent. Mike shook his head worriedly. The sender didn't identify. I did think I caught some of the words, but I can't say for sure. Well, what were they, man? What were they? I, I thought, he said, they were coming for me. My position is Latty, and right then the transmission broke off completely. That's when I buzzed your rooms. I've been working this mic ever since, and getting nothing but nothing. Biff stepped into the room. He crossed to the three men. Was that my uncle you were talking about? Mike and the other man looked at Jack Hudson. It was obvious that they wouldn't speak unless he gave them the go-ahead. Jack looked at Biff. He didn't reply at once. Then, having reached his decision, he answered, Yes, Biff, I'm afraid it was. Afraid? Biff felt a tingle of fear race up his spine. What do you mean? Is my uncle in danger? Jack Hudson's shoulders sagged. He shook his head as if trying to rid himself of unpleasant thoughts. Come along, Biff. I'll tell you about it over some coffee. At the door, he turned back. Keep trying, Mike. You might raise him. And if you do, I'll buzz you fast. In the mess hall, the servants had already set the breakfast table. Two of them padded about the room silently on their bare feet. Biff sat down to a plate containing an oval-shaped reddish fruit, streaked with white. It's the fruit of the durian tree. Try it. We think it's delicious. If you don't like it, though, there's fresh pineapple or guava. The taste was like nothing Biff had ever eaten before. He didn't know whether he liked it or not. And he didn't care. There were more important things than breakfast fruit right now. Tell me about Uncle Charlie. Jack sipped some coffee. I'll tell you what I can, Biff. It won't be much. I don't know it all myself. I know where he went, and I think I know why. The why is what I can't tell you. Was there danger in this trip of Uncle Charlie's? Danger? perhaps. Always dangerous crossing the border, but Charlie should have been able to handle it. Biff felt his heart pound. Your uncle left here exactly eight days ago. He left early in the morning. He needed the cover of night to fly across the border. The border? What border? Biff asked. The border into Red China. That border's closed, you know, especially to Americans. Jack paused to light a cigarette. He took off in a light, four-place plane. It's the type of plane that Charlie could land or take off in on a dime. It carried extra fuel tanks. How long did he expect to be gone? He didn't know for certain. Not more than four or five days, he said. Four or five days, Biff thought, and eight days had passed. We've been expecting him, watching for him, I've flown from dawn to daylight myself in the last three days, hoping to spot him or his plane, if he was forced down. Nothing. He didn't break radio silence once from the time he left. Until this morning, Biff cut in. Yes, until this morning, if that was Charlie. Have you any idea where he was going in China? Jack shook his head. Not exactly. 
With the extra tanks, he had fuel for about 1,200 miles. So, since he had to return, he must have expected to find what he was looking for not more than 500 miles inside China. And you can't tell me your ideas of what his search was for. Jack hesitated. All I can tell you would be the results of my own speculations. Your uncle was at Cape Canaveral, as you know, and he must know a lot about guided missiles. He was one of the Navy's top young officers. Well, put your thinking cap on. Maybe between us we can come up with something. Biff thought hard. There were many parts to this puzzle. He thought he himself was probably one of them. But fitting them together into an answer, that would take more than minutes, hours or even days to do. Too many important parts of the puzzle were still missing. Biff thought that perhaps now he should fill Jack in on his own small mystery. His hand went to his keychain and touched the jade ring. He made a decision. He wouldn't mention the ring. He would only tell Jack about what had happened when he arrived at the Rangoon airport. Quickly he told Jack the story. As he poured it out rapidly, Jack's look of worried concern deepened. There must be some connection. Charlie disappears, and you're almost kidnapped. Describe the man again. Biff sketched the three men in as best he could. I only saw the one called Nam Palung closely. He said he was the number one man here at Explorations. Never heard of him. Was he Chinese or Burmese? I'd say Chinese, Biff answered, although I don't really know how Burmese look. Jack was thoughtful. But Jack, Biff said, we're not just going to sit here, are we? Can't we do something? Can't we go into China and find Uncle Charlie? Go into China? Impossible. You get any such idea out of your head. That idea, though, was very much in Biff's head. The idea had been growing from the moment he first heard of his uncle's disappearance. I mean that, Jack said. You have no idea of the difficulty in crossing the border. It's patrolled night and day, and the border guards shoot to kill. Man and boy sat in silence, both deep in thought. The silence was suddenly broken. A native boy about Biff's age, but smaller, came running into the room. Sahib Jack! Come on, run! Come on, run! Quick, quick! He ran out of the room. Biff and Jack were at his heels.